We saw it. But you all, we looked back and we, we had a wonderful view that, oh my, what's in store for us? Yes. It's going to be awesome. Because, you know, he never decreases, he always increases. And I know that he has a blessing with my name on it and one with yours. Amen. Yes. Amen. He loves us, right? We love him. Yes. yes. And it says that God is trying to his ear to hear our prayers and our worship. And so I was studying that one, one day, and so when it, it, talk, it talks about he inclines, he actually stands up. So is what that means. And so for myself, you know, Nina likes to think that he's sitting there, you know, talking to Jesus and, you know, Moses you know, have a conversation. But he hears me when I start worshiping and praying. And he's like, wait just a minute. I hear one of mine. Let me see what's going on. So he stands up and he looks over and he sees me. To see what I'm hollering about. To see what I'm, because I'm hollering and worshiping my victory. So he's wanting to see what's going on while I'm proclaiming a victory to make sure there's nobody bothering me. Because he knows that I know that no matter what the circumstances are in the world, I praise him. When he hears that, he's looking down because I'm not needed. Because he's a good father. Amen? Amen. So I love that scripture. And also in Psalm 22, 3, it says, God inhabits our praises. He, he sits in the midst of us. It means that he comes in when we're praising him. And he's actually coming into the garden, Nina's thinking, and sitting right here, you know, and watching his children praise and clap and worship him. Come on. Because he loves it. Yeah. And that's what we should do. When we come into his door, we should have a heart of thanksgiving for his goodness and his kindness and his mercy over our life, right? How do you so good to him? And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets. 
and a reward came after the ark. The priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. Verse 10, Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, and nor make any noise with your voice. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you to shout. Then shall ye shout. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about at once. They came to the camp, and they lodged in the camp. Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, went on continually. And blew with the trumpets, the armed men went before them, but the reward came after the ark of the Lord. The priests, going on, and blow with the trumpets. Verse 14. The second day, they accomplished the city once, returned to the camp, so they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early, about the dawning of the day, compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it, and all are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that were sent. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the cursed thing, that you make yourselves accursed. When you take up the cursed thing, make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver, all the gold, and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated to the Lord, and they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted. When the priests blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass, when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. So remember, we just read in Joshua 6.20. Now focus on this part. In the scripture it says, and the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell flat, so that the people went up into the city. You know, in the Message Bible, it tells us the priests blew the trumpets when the people heard the blast of the trumpets. They gave a thunderclap shout. Now, I don't really know what a thunderclap shout is, but I can imagine just from the thunderstorms, it was pretty loud, right? The people gave a thunderclap shout, and the wall fell down immediately when they did that. And then the people rushed straight to the city, and they took the city. So if we go back to our text, we see that the people were straight to the city, and they took it. So before this happened, at the beginning of the chapter, we find that Joshua and the children of Israel approached the city of Jericho. At this point, God immediately tells Joshua two different things. And the first thing he says is, I have given you the city. Then the second thing that he tells is, God gave him the strategy, or the plan, how to take that city, didn't he? He told him exactly what to do on each day. So in Joshua chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, we notice the first thing that God told Joshua was that he had already given him the city of Jericho. Now, God didn't say, I'm going to give you that city. He didn't say he was getting ready to give him the city. But God was calling those things as though they were, right? He said he already gave him that city. He plainly proclaimed it. Amen? Amen. Now, the truth is, you know, in the natural, the circumstances that he was looking at, they not really possessed that city, had they? In the natural, those big walls, and, you know, those walls were 30 feet tall. They were still standing. And in the natural, the enemies, they still inhabited the land. They were still in the city, right? But God said, I know your enemies are still in that city. He said, I know that those walls are still standing there. And I know that 
It's sad to steal your promise, but I have already given you the city. Hallelujah. <coughs> God declared that in spite of whatever you see, He's already given you the city. It's already done. I know you can't see it, but it's yours. God is saying, I already spoke it, I ordained it. So God says, in my thinking, it's already completed, finished. And it is worth the Bible. God's promised to do great things for all of us, hasn't he? Great things for you and for you. In your life, in your children's lives, he's promised great things in the Bible about your finances, about your ministry, and even our businesses and our prosperity. And I know that some of you are believing someday that the things that God is saying in the Bible will come to pass for you, right? Some of you believe that someday what God said will happen. To make it a little bit plainer, you might be believing that someday you're going to get out of your Egypt. You're going to make it to your promised land, to the promises that God has given us. Amen? You believe you're going to get out of the pit, you're going to get into the palace. Some of you are saying, I might be a shepherd boy today, but one day I'm going to be a king. Amen? Amen? Some of you have something inside of you, and it's causing you to stand against the situations in your life, and it's making you believe that a day is coming that you're going to get out of your poverty, and you're going to move into that palace. Something is causing you to believe the day is coming that you won't have to ask for a ride, but someday you'll possibly even own your own vehicle. Amen? Amen? Somebody hearing what we're talking about tonight is believing that your child is going to be delivered off of drugs. That your child is coming out of pornography or adultery. Somebody here is believing that they have a ministry that's about to expand. Somebody's believing that your business is about to prosper. Somebody's believing that every bill that you have is about to be paid. And you're going to be debt free, amen? amen? Somebody's believing right now that they are healed, that they are set free, that their family is healed and delivered, and there's no more torment in your life. And somebody's believing they have no more anxiety, no more depression, hallelujah? hallelujah. And some of you are believing that the Lord, you know, like the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, you're on the ship. And that ship's going to sink. It's, you're feeling that it's about to go under. You're on the verge of a marriage issue, a divorce, or you're on the verge of financial issues. Maybe your son or your daughter is meeting some kind of issues with drugs or with going to jail. Something your life's messed up. But you're like Paul. And you're standing on the bow of the ship, and you're proclaiming it. Even in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the mess of your life, in the middle of your loneliness, in the middle of a financial problem, you're just going to shout these two words. I believe. Can we do that tonight? I believe. I believe. I believe. But you have confidence that he's right on time. Amen? Amen. Many of you are believing, you know, but let's face the facts. While many of you are believing that God will do what he said, believing that all these promises will come to pass, believing that you will be blessed beyond measure, healed and delivered, you're believing for a new car, a house, prosperity, a new job. You're believing that your children, your neighbor, your family is going to be saved. The fact is, you don't have any evidence of that miracle in front of you right now, do you? You know, I discovered something. When you get your bills paid by somebody, or maybe when you come across that new house, or get a little extra bonus pay, maybe you get a new car, maybe your son comes home and says, Hey, Mom. I'm off that man and get my life together. Or when your daughter comes home and says, you know what? Jesus appeared in my car. 
then talk to me. When it's your kids that get saved and your family gets free from sickness, when that happens, nobody will ever have to tell you to praise the Lord, be a boy. Okay. When this happens, nobody has to tell you to give God a shout of praise. Nobody has to say thank you, Jesus, right? Because you're automatically going to do it. When good things are happening in your life, it's automatic for us, isn't it? It's inside of you and it comes out. This thing called praise and a shout of joy. When God does what he says he, he's going to, when you receive that thing that you've been believing, for nobody has to tell you then to give God praise, do they? But that little river of praise, it starts flowing inside of you and it has to come out. And I'll say it again. When you get blessed, set free, saved, nobody has to tell you to praise the Lord. Now people may tell you to quiet your praise down sometimes. Because some religious people, they get nervous when you start shouting and clapping and hollering and thanking the Lord. But again, they don't have to tell you to praise the Lord. They just tell you to hush. God told Joshua, I've already given you the city. If you start thinking like God, you'll not go around saying all the time, someday I'm going to receive that. But instead, you're going to start saying, even if I don't see it, I believe it. Yes. And even though there's no manifestation, God said it, therefore, I believe it. It's done. It's mine, right? Now, I'm not into this name it and claim it like, oh, I'm a millionaire, I'm going to get a helicopter, that kind of thing. I'm not saying that the Lord can't bless you that way. But I do believe in claiming our healing, in claiming prosperity, in claiming the freedom, those types of things. So, um, even though you don't see it with your natural eyes, if you start putting those spiritual eyeglasses on, you can start seeing it right. I mean, it might be a new car. Maybe you're just out there in the middle of your driveway, just hollering and praising the Lord, thanking Him for everything that, you know, thank you for this vehicle, Lord. Praise you, Jesus, for this vehicle. And your neighbor is looking over at you and saying, what are you doing? <laughs> and you're like, I'm praising the Lord for my new car. Yes. And they're like, well, I see a bicycle there, buddy. No. And you're like, well, you're not looking through God's eyes because I know the promises he gave me. Amen? Because, you know, in your world, there's nothing there but a bunch of them. But in God's world, it's my new car. It might not be brand new, but it'd be new to me. Amen? And I see it right here in my driveway, and I'm going really to speak it out. In God's word, it's already there in them. And it's ours. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, in the same way, for the new car, we can see our healing. Even though that manifestation isn't there in our bodies yet, you can see that your child is delivered. You can see that your brothers and sisters are set free and serving the Lord. You can proclaim it with your mouth. You can claim it over your life. That they're serving the Lord and they're healed. Amen? Amen. And I pray that the Lord will open our eyes today to see what's in His world. When you start thinking like the Lord, then you'll start talking like Him. Amen? Amen. And when you start talking like Jesus, like God, according to Romans 4.13, you'll start calling those things that be not as though they were. Right? As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him who we believe, even God, who quickened the dead, and call those things which be not as though they were. You can act like <coughs> you are out of poverty and free from your sicknesses. You can act like you're the richest person in your neighborhood if you want to. And even though you hardly have nickel to your name, but you know that his promises are true, that that job is coming, so you will have the money that you'll need for your family. Amen? Amen. 
You can declare that you're healed, even though your body's not manifesting a healing and showing some symptoms. You don't have to claim that. But you can claim the promise that the Lord gave us, and that's we're healed. Hallelujah. Circumstances won't affect you because you know what the Lord has already declared over you and over your life. God's already established these things in the heavens. Amen? Amen. Yes. And what God is establishing in the heaven is getting ready to be established on the earth for us. And since it's already established in heaven, God already said it. We just need to go ahead and start believing it over ourselves. Amen? Amen. Not only believing, we have to start an action that goes along with that belief. We have to start proclaiming it. Hallelujah? Hallelujah. And... This is how you can praise God in that midnight hour. This is how you can go to bed at night when you don't know where your children are. It's how you can keep a smile on your face when they come to take your car away because you couldn't afford to make your payments. And the devil says, ha ha, your faith didn't work over that, did it? But you can say, devil, they may be taking that one out, <coughs> but you haven't seen what I saw coming into me. Amen? Amen. Since I believe that God is going to do what he said, I'm not going to wait until I get my miracle. And I don't have to wait until I see God perform those promises to give him a shout of praise to him. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to shout it out now. God's getting ready to establish some things here on earth. So I'm going to shout out my blessings. God already spoke it, so I'm going to shout it. And watch out, because I might like get real loud. Amen? Amen? God already decreed it. And we need to start learning how to shout that out. Do I have it in my hand right now? No, I don't have it in the natural. But God said it. I believe it. I'm claiming it. And I'm going to shout it out. All we have to do is start giving the Lord some praise for some things in our lives. Even the small things. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, we don't have to wait till we have it. We don't have to wait till next week or next month. We need to start that and make it a daily routine to give him the thanks that he deserves. We need to say, I'm going to shout that now. I've got it and the devil's not going to steal my praise. That line devil, he's not going to take my promises. He's never going to steal my destiny. Hallelujah. We need to tell ourselves that we can start that shout of praise. You don't got to wait. You know, the children of Israel, they did not wait till the walls fell down to shout, did they? They began to shout when the walls were still standing up. They continued to shout while they remained intact right in front of them. All throughout the word of God, you will find the Lord telling his people to give him a shout. All throughout the Bible, it declares to shout to the Lord. In Psalms 5, 11, it tells us, But let those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. Because thou defend them, let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. In Psalms 47, 1, O oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. All throughout the Bible, you'll find people shouting, shouting for the Lord. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of the joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. First Samuel tells us, And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the camp, all of Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. I think it's about time for the Christians to give God praise so loud. I mean loud enough to get the earth to start ringing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When will we stop? God doesn't tell us to shout just to be shouting. There's a reason that he tells us to shout. He does not tell us to shout so we can lose our voices because we scream so loud. He doesn't tell us to shout so the religious people that's around us think we're some kind of fanatical nut. There's a power in your shout. As a child of God, that will cause hell to start trembling. We've got to get this revelation. We have to own it. 
There is something about when a child of God opens their mouth in the middle of all chaos. When the situations around us look hopeless and that child of God shouts out hallelujah, the devil's minions, they tremble and they scatter like cops when you turn the lights on. Amen? When you get a whole group of people together, and we got more than one here, right? We got a group. When they get together in unity and they give out a shout of praise to the Lord, do you know that it penetrates the heaven and it can drive back darkness? The darkness that's hindering your prayers from going to the throne. Heaven knows your shout. Did you know that? And hell knows your shout too. Our shouts are kind of like a fingerprint. You know, here on earth, no one has the same fingerprint. So if you check my fingerprints, they would say, oh, that's Nina's. But when the angels hear my shout, they say, oh, that's Nina. That's Nina down there. That's her. She's hollering out for the Lord. And then God says, move. Hallelujah. And the same can be for you. For some of you, God does not hear too much praise or shouting from you, if we're honest, right? For others of you, the Lord <coughs> hears you every day, shouting His praises and His goodness. When you begin to shout, it weakens the enemy. When you begin to shout, it will silence the enemy. It silences the enemy that's torturing your life. Isn't that awesome? It can silence his roar that you hear. It causes the walls of hell to tremble. It damages the structure of hell when you start your shout and your praise. There's power in a praise shout. And when you shout, you cause the devil to tremble and the heavens to open up. One of the major coliseums, I was reading this, um, in the state of Oklahoma, had a major event a few years ago. And the people were shouting so loud that the structure actually got damaged. And they had to have several millions of dollars in restructure repairs and rebuilding. Because uh, there was like 60 to 70,000 people that were in the Coliseum. And they shouted so loud at that ball game, it actually damaged the foundation. Isn't that crazy? But all truth is parallel. If they can shout so loud at a ball game, Come on. That it fractures a man-made structure. What does it do to hell when the children of God start raising their voice and giving a shout out to God, our Father, the Creator of all? Amen. What happens when we start our shouts? I'll tell you what it does. It damages and it fractures the structures of hell in our lives. Your shout will weaken the enemy. Your shout will bring down strongholds in your life and in others' lives around you. Your shout causes walls to start crumbling down. Your shout will cause that thing between you and your destiny to vanish, to disappear. And that's why I'm telling you that in spite of what hell you're going through, whatever the situation, give God a shout of praise right in the middle of it. Because your walls are getting ready to come down. Your hindrances are getting ready to be gone. Barriers are being broken just from your shout. So shout to the Lord with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some churches, though, you know what? They don't want to hear this type of teaching. Some churches, they like their church to be quiet and boring. The devil, he likes it quiet and boring because it doesn't disturb his kingdom. Because when you shout, shout and you praise the Lord, it upsets him. So he wants you to be quiet. He wants you not to clap. He wants you not to praise. He wants you not to sing or say nothing about the Lord and his goodness. But you know, the Lord gave me a revelation on the power of the shout. And I'm telling you, it's your time to shout as a child of God. Amen? Amen. In the 13th chapter of 2 Chronicles, it says, um, but we, you can read it in there about um, war between the tribe of Judah and the other tribes of Israel. And there was a war between two kings because some wanted to follow God and his plan while others wanted to follow the plan of man. 
In verse 13, um, it picks up in the back there. It says, but Jeroboam caused an ambush to come about behind them. So they were before Judah, and the ambushment was behind them. And when Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and was behind. And they cried unto the Lord, and the priests sounded the trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout. And as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijam and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their land. In 2 Chronicles 13, 13 through 16, the people of God gave out a shout, didn't they? And God came down from heaven to earth, and he smote them. Every one of their enemies. I looked up the word shout, because you know I like to look in the dictionary. And I always heard about um, praises, and we've talked about that before, but in, in the verses we've been talking about tonight, the Lord says shout. And we know what shout means, right? Some of the definitions uh, are rejoice, make a joyful noise, but I got to look at the original meaning of the word. So shout in Hebrew and Greek. If you have a Greek or Hebrew uh, concordance, that is um, a way to look up words, the English words, and see what they were translated. Uh, so you should grab one if you don't have one. If the original translation is from the Hebrew, the word uh, that we get our word shout from includes rejoicing and making a joyful noise, but there's a deeper meaning to this. In this word, it means to break, and to destroy. When we shout, we destroy the thing that's holding us back. When we shout that praise, the walls begin to break down. When we shout it out, we are releasing and destroying everything under our anointing. Amen? Amen? When we shout, it releases a breaking anointing. And that starts breaking those meth addictions. Those drug addictions, the alcohol, the, the alcoholism, it starts breaking off poverty in people's lives. It starts breaking off sicknesses. And it starts breaking off depression. Hallelujah. So shout. We need to shout for the Lord because the Lord has given us a city. Shout to the Lord for he has smitten our enemies, right? Shout to the Lord. So go ahead and shout to the Lord. Praise the Lord. You need to start raising your voice to heaven. You know what? Hell's on alert. There's been a text message you see it. All the little demons, their phones are going ding, ding, ding. You know, the emails are going off. Little Lucifer, he might even got a fax. I don't know. It says in there, though, in the message, you better get away. Because when that shout pops up, he better get to scatter. Amen? Because there's going to be something that's going to start breaking off. The sun's going to be moving in the earth. The big daddy, he's getting ready to shake some things up when he hears his children shout. Amen. Come on. Amen. So, your shout's loosening a breakthrough. And that anointing's going to destroy yokes. It's going to destroy bondages in your life, in your children's life, and in your family's life, your neighbor's lives. There's going to be deliverance and freedom. Hallelujah. You know that God said to Joshua, I've given you a city. The truth was that they had not possessed that city, but they were at the edge of that city, wasn't they? They were there looking at the walls. They were at the edge of their promise, wasn't they? Sitting on the edge of the next level of their destiny. Can I ask you, how many of you know that it's not good enough to just be on that edge? How many of you know that it's being close is just not good enough. You're almost there. You can see it. You're just a few feet away. But you're not there yet. Some of you are almost healed. Your family is almost delivered. Your promise is almost there. Something down deep inside is telling you, I'm almost there. I'm getting there. You feel it inside. Something inside says, I'm about to cross over. Do you feel like you're about to cross over? Do you feel like you're about to step into your destiny? 
But how many know that being close is not good enough? How many know it's not good enough to be standing on that edge? It's not good enough to be this close. A lot of people are almost there. Some people are going to die within just a stone's throw of their destiny. Did you know that? Moses looked at the promised land from a mountain, but he did not get to enter it. The children of Israel, they were on the edge of their promise, almost at the next level of their destiny, wet man. God said to them, I've given you a city. There's only one problem. How many know that usually when you have a promise, you might have a problem? So I can reword that. Um, how many of you know that when you have a promise, you usually have a whole lot of problems that come? Some of you have so many problems that your middle name might have been wrong. But you know what? We all know who that problem solver is. Amen? Amen. God says the city is yours already. He didn't say it's going to be. He said it is. It's yours. I have given you the city. I have given you the promises. But you know what? There's a problem. There seems to be a wall. And that wall is between you and your promise, the destiny, your next level. In fact, it wasn't just a wall that they were up against. You know, the historians tell us there was actually two walls were in Jericho. And these walls were 30 feet high. I know I mentioned that earlier. But can you imagine how high a 30-foot wall is? Not just one, there was two. One of these walls, the inner wall, was not only 30 feet high, it was also between 11 and 12 feet wide. That's pretty wide. It was so wide because they had horses that would ride on it in small chariots. The outer wall, which was also 30 feet tall, it was 6 feet wide. So for Israel to get their promise, to lay hold of what God had already promised them, they had to somehow get through two walls. Now, how are they going to do it? They probably talk between themselves, but like, oh, we could probably climb over it. Let's knock a hole in it. You know, find some way to destroy that wall. Um, but you know, they can't. It's too high. None of them were that tall. It's really thick. And you know, not only that, they had a bunch of guards. There was all kinds of guards watching it. But they had to get through that wall to get to their promise. Some of you, the only thing keeping you from your promise or keeping your children from their destiny or keeping you from being healed, debt free, um, it's that wall. You have a wall between you and your promise. Some of you don't even know what your wall is, but you know that something is there stopping you, right? Some of you have a wall in front of you that you can't see to see a way to ever get through that wall. And what is so disturbing, you know you're close. You know that it's just a few feet away from you. And it took a long time to get where you are right now. But it seems like it's taken an eternity to get that last few feet. You're aggravated. You might get frustrated. You might get mad at the teacher or the preacher. You might get mad at the Lord. You might get mad at your husband, your wife. Mad at yourself even. Mad at your dog, your cat. Mad at everything. Even your husband, your wife, the preacher, the teacher, the dog, the cat, even the fleas on them. And everything else has nothing to do with what your troubles are. Some of you can't see any way to get through. And it's exactly where the children of Israel were when they were in in Joshua, in chapter 6, that we read earlier. But you know what? God had a plan, didn't he? And the plan was in the shout. Now, some of you would really get spiritual right now, and just like, if I said the plan was in prayer. Some of you would fall to your knees and start all back and pray, praying, oh God, help me. If I said his plan was taking your Bible everywhere you go, some of you probably buy five or six Bibles and pack them around, wouldn't you? But no, God said, I got a plan. 
My plan is something that will convey on the whole world. My plan is in a weapon that is not natural. My plan is a shout. The victory was in a shout. So God told Joshua to go around the city one time for six days. The seventh day, go around seven times. Did you know when Joshua lived in the room of walls of Jericho? I really like this. He was 80 years old. 80 years old. Some of you walk from the car out there inside this church, and you're out of breath, and you can't even stand up to praise the Lord when you get in here. Right? But Joshua was 80 years old. And he was saying, come on, boys. Y'all need to follow me. The Lord gave me a word. You ought to start shouting. My strength's renewed. Yes. Follow me. We're going to take this city. Amen? Amen. Amen? On the seventh day and the seventh time around, have the children of Israel make a long blast. What did God say? And the walls will come down. But not only come down, he said they come down flat. Come down flat. Now the people... So shout a great shout, and when they get out a long blast with the ram's horn and the trumpet, and when the people start shouting, the walls will come down flat. And Joshua did that, and the walls were suddenly, they fell, right? So I want everybody to get on their feet and they need to start clapping. Get up, start clapping. Walls fell down flat and they took the city. 
Do you think we should not only pray for our children, our friends, our family, or even ourselves? That whatever is hindering them or us from reaching our destiny to be removed, but what if we started to shout at that hindrance to be crushed? Yes. In Exodus 15, 6, it says, Thy right hand, O Jehovah, is become honorable in power. Thy right hand, O Jehovah, doth crush an enemy. Not to just bring it down, but to crush it. We don't just want to see something come down that's hindering us. We want to see it crushed, made flat. We want to see the earth open up and swallow it so we won't have to fight it anymore. Just like with Joshua and the children of Israel, there was a wall between them and their promise, wasn't there? People need to start beating that wall. Amen? Amen. You need to start beating it. Not only with your prayer, your prayer, your travailing, and your interceding, we need to realize that right on the other side of that wall is what we need, our destiny, our healing. On the other side of that wall is somebody's marriage, is somebody's destiny, somebody's children, and somebody's freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everything that God has promised his people is right on the other side of that wall. In the body of Christ, you know it's a large army. It's a large army of people, and sometimes they're praying. They're travailing for the Lord, but they get tired. Anybody ever get tired? Today, it seems like God's people are just starting to get weary. You can look at the older days and compare to nowadays. And I know Pastor Danny talks about it a lot, about the power and the, and the way that things were then compared to now. The people today, they still pray, but they, they've lost something. They're losing their passion. They still love the Lord, and they hold on with a little hope that somehow that wall might come down and they might see the things that they're desperately believing for. Some are saying if you could get this court case settled, and if you could just move out of poverty into prosperity, if you could pay my bills, if you could just put me on a big stage and let me preach, if I could just get my ministry going forward. But then they're tired because they're praying at the wall. Because they keep praying, one day they look in the wall above. If they shout out, it will be gone. They can just pick up their feet then, and then they can walk right into that promised land what the Lord promised them. Amen? Amen? They don't have to climb over anything. They don't have to move anything. Remember, the earth opened up and swallowed the walls of Jericho. How many people know that God is more than able to make a wall disappear and to vanish? And all the people have to do is then walk right into their destiny. Yeah. But it costs you something, doesn't it? Yeah. Somebody needs to start shouting. Somebody needs to start praising the Lord. On the other side of your wall is your children saved, your children delivered. On the other side of that wall is... Everything that you need, your healing, the miracle that we're looking for, your prosperity, your new house, or whatever. But not only that, new revelations, new relationship. On the other side of that wall is everything that you need because it's your destiny. Your prayers can break down walls, but your shout of praise with these prayers will accelerate the bringing down of the wall. And then your wall will be swallowed up. Amen? Amen. So what are you waiting for? We need to give the Lord a shout every day, and not just a shout, a shout of praise and of honor. Amen? Because he's worthy. We need a shout because we need to start damaging the walls of hell that's coming against us. We need to shout out because God has given you a city and the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violence will take it by force. Amen? Amen? And that force for us is going to start being in 2022 our shout to the Lord. Come on. We're going to shout to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you.